Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today I want to talk about something that's happening here in Alberta that I think is going to shock a lot of people, including people who support the government here. But this is the Provincial Administrative Penalties Act. Now let's first talk about how they're going to be implementing this. So they've got it in three phases, and this is really a boil the frog kind of approach because they're starting off with phase one, which is aimed at impaired drivers. Now, people tend not to like impaired drivers. There's not a whole lot of sympathy for impaired drivers. So that's where they're starting this out so that there's less public complaint. Phase two, on the other hand, is going to be all traffic safety offenses. And then phase three is basically everything else that the province handles. So think fish and wildlife offenses if you happen to be a hunter. This is going to be a big deal because let's look at what all is in the act here. Now, part of the proposal, from what I understand, is to replace a lot of impaired driving prosecutions with proceedings under this act. Now, it's really hard to call them sort of proceedings. They're very much uh, an unusual uh, procedure here. Let's talk about just how unusual because this is a bit of a big deal in my view. So let's start, and I'm going to start in the boring part, I'm sorry, but this is interpretation. So this is setting some of our definitions. So first is administrative penalty, which includes a fine and any other administrative consequence, including without limitation, a sanction, restriction, prohibition, requirement, condition, suspension, disqualification, or cancellation imposed on a person for contravention of a prescribed enactment, but does not include imprisonment. So they're specifically excluding imprisonment, and part of the reason for doing that is that they're trying to protect this law as much as they can from charter scrutiny. And if they included imprisonment as a possibility here, they are more worried that the court will overturn it. But think about this. A driving prohibition would be included in this. You know, similarly, a cancellation of your hunting license and a prohibition from hunting would be included under this. A requirement that you attend courses or a requirement that you install a blow box. So this actually can have a lot of impact on your life, notwithstanding the fact that they've taken imprisonment off the table. Now, contravention is defined very broadly. It includes, without limitation, a failure to comply with a restriction, prohibition, requirement, rule, direction, order, term, or condition imposed by or under a prescribed enactment, or conduct that is subject to sanction under a prescribed enactment, or any other action prescribed as a contravention under this act or a prescribed enactment. So basically, doing anything that they say is against the law. That's a big, broad category. I also just highlighted here medical information, because medical information means information provided uh, or created by a person who is licensed or authorized by law to practice medicine in the place where the person practices. Uh, notice of administrative penalty, so they just will send out notices. Let's look at how this works here. So the purpose of the act, so this is where they're talking, this isn't really law here, this is them explaining why they want this law and this is sort of the sorts of things that might be considered by a court when they're deciding if this law is constitutional. So first, to adopt a simplified form and process for administratively enforcing contraventions. Now think, simplified. Who's simplified really likely to benefit? Is it going to benefit you? No, it's going to benefit the government. So simplified means a more direct path between them accusing you of an offense and them punishing you. They don't want those obstacles like right to a fair trial or, you know, presumption of innocence or any of those things. They want to get rid of as much of that as possible. And we're going to see that happening in this in a really big way. Uh, another one here is resolve disputes in relation to administrative penalties in an expedient manner consistent with the procedural protections mandated by this act. Now, the dispute here is that they want to punish you and you say, I don't want to be punished because maybe, for instance, you didn't do it. But they want an expedient process for that as opposed to a fair and thorough process. Is that, does that sound like something you want? I'm thinking probably no. 
and affirm that the consequences may not include imprisonment. Again, this is an attempt to shield themselves from uh, shield themselves from judicial review here, and enhance access to justice. They're not enhancing access to justice here uh, by establishing an administrative enforcement process that can be readily understood and provides a simple method for disputing a notice of administrative penalty. Note, simple, but not necessarily effective. So that's going to be a big deal. Let's look at how this law works now, how it's going to actually apply in practice. So contravention, issuance of notice of administrative penalty. An officer who has reasonable grounds to believe that a person has committed a contravention may issue a notice of administrative penalty to that person. This replaces the previous procedure where they would tell you that you have been charged with an offense that, you know, and, you know, that you have a trial date or, you know, a court appearance or the like. Instead, they're just going to issue you with the punishment. So they start out with, we think you've done it. Here is the punishment you will be facing. And if you do nothing else, you are facing that punishment. So you're presumed guilty here because they're just giving you the punishment without actually taking the time to determine, did you actually do it in a court? You have a right to request a review. And if you wish to dispute that, you have seven days. Count them. Seven. That's not a long time. You're going to have a hard time, for instance, if you want to hire a lawyer to fight this, getting them, you know, up to speed within seven days. But a lot of people are going to end up, you know, just missing this by pure life goes on, right? You've got stuff going on in your life. So that's going to be a problem. And here's another fun part. Uh, file with the director a request for review in a form and containing the content satisfactory to the minister. So they get to say what you have to include and pay the prescribed fee. So if you want to challenge this, it's going to cost you. Even if you're going without a lawyer, they can tell you what the price is for you saying, I didn't do it. So not only are you presumed guilty, but if you want any sort of review, they can charge you for that. Huh. Also note, the filing of a request for review of a notice of administrative penalty does not stay the administrative penalty. So what that means is that if they've punished you with something like, for instance, a ban on driving, the fact that you've said, wait a minute, I didn't do it, doesn't stop that driving prohibition from being in effect. So if a police officer doesn't like you and issues you a notice of, you know, they're banning you from driving, you're going to be banned from driving regardless for whatever period until you can get it heard, assuming that you can get it heard and actually revoked, which is unlikely for reasons we'll talk about here. So failure to respond. So subject to any extension, they can give you extensions. If you haven't filed a request for review uh, or paid any applicable fine and any applicable surcharge within the period, then the fine uh, becomes payable to the Crown and they can come after you for that money. So, and rest assured, they will be coming after you for the money in various ways. They're going to have all sorts of ways that they can come after you to collect. Note also, the director shall, after receiving a request for review in the prescribed fee, assign an adjudicator to conduct the review, which will be a single adjudicator. No, these aren't judges. These are, you know, not judicial officials. The... The, it looks like the pool for these people is going to be basically ex-police officers and ex-park, you know, fish and wildlife officers and so forth. So your chances of getting an unbiased hearing here are not very good. You're going to have an adjudicator who probably is going to be empathizing with the other side before you even walk in the door. Wonderful. Uh, duty to provide records to recipient. So this sounds good. They've got to give you material. It's not so good. Let's look at this. The director shall, after receiving a request for review and the prescribed fee, so if you're poor and you don't have the money, you can't get your justice. Sorry. Nope. That you're just going to have to eat the penalty. That's all you've got. Uh, provide to the recipient, in accordance with the regulations, relevant records as prescribed in the regulations or the regulations under a prescribed enactment. 
So they get to choose what they give you based on what's in the, uh, the laws there. Unless required by the regulations uh, or the regulations under a prescribed enactment, the director is not required to provide a recipient with any records, representations, or arguments in respect of an alleged contravention beyond the records referred to in subsection 1. So if they have something that you think is important but is not specified, like say, for example, you want the disciplinary history of the officer to find out if they've ever lied in court before. If it's not specified that they have to provide that, then they don't. Uh, let's say you've got a speeding ticket via photo radar and you want to know, have they actually done their required maintenance on this? Is this thing up to spec? Did it pass its last tests? Unless that's in the regulations, they don't have to give that to you. So they get to choose what evidence you get. Does that sound like fun? Does that sound like a fair hearing? Mm, I'm thinking maybe not. So subject to subsection 2, which is a limitation period, you've got to give them some time, which is two days. That's not so bad. Uh, and the regulations or the regulations under prescribed enactment, a recipient may provide to the director records representations, arguments, or evidence in support of a request for review. So you can send in written materials to say why. However, it's subject to limitations. They can tell you what evidence you can and cannot submit, and what arguments you cannot, can and cannot make. Again, this is sounding like a real fair hearing, isn't it? It gets goes even better. Document deemed made under oath. This is a really nasty provision, and it may not seem like it. Let's uh, sort of look at why this is nasty. So a report, notes, or other document confirmed by an officer in accordance with the regulations is deemed to have been made under oath. What that means is that the court will treat it as though it's a sworn statement. But it's not a sworn statement. The officer is not actually swearing the oath, which means that I can't see the officer being prosecutable for perjury if they lie in this. So this section essentially allows the officer to be treated as though they are under oath without being under oath and without being under the same strictures that being under oath would normally entail. This is essentially a provision that really does a lot to protect a liar because if they are found to be lying, it's very difficult to see how they'd actually be punished as if it was an actual oath because they haven't sworn the oath. They haven't taken on that responsibility. So essentially what this says is that the off, the evidence of a police officer is better than your evidence. Just It's better, it's going to be on a higher level and tough. You don't have any uh, particular you know aspect to that. Uh, the data review will be within 21 days from the issuance of the notice of administrative penalty. So very fast might be wondering, how can they be ready so fast? Well, they don't have to worry about being ready because all of their evidence is going to go in and is going to be taken as true. And this is not a fair process. This is not something there's, they don't have to get ready for this because you will not be in a position to really challenge these. Sorry. So means of review. Uh, review may be conducted orally or in writing as prescribed but shall not be conducted in person. So if you thought, hey, I've got a right to face my accuser, which isn't entirely a thing in Canada, but if you thought, you know, hey, I'm going to be there, I'm going to, you know, have my day in court, no, you're going to have your day over the telephone or maybe over Zoom. You're not going to have your day in court. Oral reviews may be held by electronic means, including any method of telecommunication in accordance with the regulations. So you're probably going to be over the phone or possibly, you know, via WebEx, Zoom, something like that. And here's another one that is just brutal. No person may be cross-examined in a review of a notice of administrative penalty. So if you think the officer is lying and you think you can show that, you think you've got the stuff to trip up that officer and show that they have lied or that they're mistaken, you don't get to do that. You do not get to cross-examine that officer. You don't get to ask them any questions. You don't get to challenge them. How is that fair? Answer, it isn't. 
it's not a fair proceeding. It doesn't even pretend to be a fair proceeding. Rules for review. So they can set rules, prohibitions, and limits for evidence and submissions under Section 13, including without limitation, maximum numbers of pages or documents submitted. So you might have to set out your argument in five pages, one page. They can tell you how long you're, you know, you get to argue for. Maximum duration for video and audio submissions and types and formats of content. Hopefully they're not going to abuse this by saying it's got to be, you know, compatible with, you know, I forget the old programs that I used to use on my Atari ST, but maybe they could. Content review. The burden of proof in a review is on the person requesting the review. So again, you are presumed guilty. You need to prove that you are not because the burden of proof is on you because you're the person who's saying, I didn't do it. So none of that innocent until proven guilty. We're going the other way. You're guilty until you prove yourself innocent. And we're actually going to make you do this with both hands tied behind your back. So good luck proving that you're innocent. An adjudicator may, in conducting a review, consider the following records, representations, arguments, and evidence before making a decision. So first, a copy of the Notice of Administrative Penalty. Uh, anything you submit, again, but they can tell you what you can and can't submit. The report of the officer who issued the Notice of Administrative Penalty, which doesn't appear to be limited in any shape or form by page limits. So you might be limited to five pages, and the report of the officer might be 13, and that's fair for reasons. Sorry. Any other relevant records and representations of the officer who issued the notice of administrative penalty or any other officer, including peace officers reports that have not been swarmed or sworn or solemnly affirmed. But again, even though they're unsworn, they're going to be treated as though they're sworn evidence in this proceeding. So the officer can give unsworn evidence in which he is free to lie and it will be treated as though it's sworn by this, I can't really call it a court. Um, maybe it's the kind of court that bounces? I think there's an animal that does that. What are we going to call that? Yeah. Any relevant scientific, technical, or medical information and documents referred to in Section 4 and any other prescribed evidence or information, the adjudicator can determine the weight to be given and they are not bound by the rules respecting evidence applicable to judicial proceedings. So why do we have rules of evidence? We have rules of evidence to keep out bad evidence. So for example, one of the rules of evidence is hearsay, which means if the officer hears through the grapevine, you know, I've heard people talking about how you poached an animal. This is extremely unreliable evidence. And so normally it's excluded from being heard in a court. Not under these provisions. Under these provisions, they're not bound by that. Similarly, in terms of that scientific evidence, there's rules that dictate what standard scientific evidence has to meet so that we're not just tendering BS. Those rules don't apply. They can tender it if they want to. Do you think that's going to help you in these proceedings? Nope, that is going to hurt you. So, lots of fun stuff in this particular legislation. Looking at what happens at the review is Division 4, so Section 21 here. After conducting a review, the adjudicator shall, subject to subsection 2, uh, if they're not satisfied that the grounds prescribed in the regulations or the regulations uh, for cancelling the administrative penalty have been met, confirm the notice. So what this means is that if you haven't shown that there are grounds to cancel the notice, then they're just going to confirm it. So again, the burden of proof is on you. You are not presumed innocent. You are presumed guilty. Or if they are satisfied that uh, you have met that standard, then they'll cancel the notice. Uh, subsection 2 is also for a particular thing of if they're saying you did it, but they haven't proved that this is a repeat offense, where there's higher penalties for repeat offenses, then uh, they can sort of apply the lower one. You'll get a copy of the decision within 30 days. 
subject to sub, uh, section 24, a decision of the adjudicator is final. So they're very much going to limit your rights to appeal here. Let's have a look at subsection 24, which is judicial review. Subject to subsection 2, no decision or order of the director or adjudicator is to be questioned or reviewed in any court by application for judicial review or otherwise, and no order is to be made, process entered, or proceedings taken in any court, whether by way of certiorari, injunction, declaratory judgment, prohibition, mandamus, co warranto, application to quash or set aside or otherwise, to question, review, prohibit, or restrain any decision or order of the director or adjudicator or any of the director or adjudicator's proceedings. So they're basically trying to say this is some special thing that is immune to all other courts except as we allow. So they're trying to essentially throw out the entirety of our judicial process to create this special, special, I, again, I don't really want to call them a court. This is a, a kangaroo court is really what they're creating. Uh, a decision or order uh, may be questioned or reviewed by way of an application for judicial review seeking an order in the nature of certiorari or mandamus if the application is filed in the court of Queen's Bench and served uh, no later than 30 days after the date on which the decision or order was received by the applicant. So again, they're really limiting uh, what sort of remedies you can have here. And they also note that the standard of review is reasonableness which is a very generous standard uh, for, not for you, again, it's not generous to you. It's a generous standard to them uh, for upholding their decisions. So there's a bunch of other stuff in here, but I think I've covered the worst of it. Essentially, what they're trying to do is create a process where the government tells you that you're guilty and you don't really have much in the way of options for that. The government just says, we're just going to punish you. And that's it. They just get to hand out punishments without proving that you did anything. In fact, if you disagree with it, you have to prove that you didn't do it. And not just prove that you didn't do it, but prove that you didn't do it in this process where you don't even get a fair shake. So this to me is ridiculous. And I should note here, most of the stuff that this covers, I don't do a whole lot of. I've never done a whole lot of. Some impaired stuff, uh, not a whole lot of Traffic Safety Act stuff, some fish and wildlife hunting stuff. But the reason why this ticks me off isn't, you know, because I'm worried that I'm going to lose business. Because that's always the nature of law. And there's always, you know, there's always business in the law. There's always stuff that needs to happen. People are going to need, you know, these proceedings. And if they're unfair, then, oh, well, people will still have to, you know, take their best shot. So I'm not worried about my bottom line here. What I'm worried about is I'm worried about if I, you know, if somebody finds me in the forest and I'm out hunting and they decide wrongly that I've done something, they can just issue me a ticket. Or if I run into a police officer who maybe I embarrassed on the stand because that happens. Police officers and defense lawyers don't necessarily always get along. And if he really wants to ruin my day, he can just start issuing me punishments. And then I don't know how I'd fight them because there isn't a fair process prescribed here. There's a very unfair process. So to my mind, this is, this is fucked up. And so I encourage you, if you are an Albertan, to write your government, especially if you are a member of the United Conservative Party, write your government, write your officials, and tell them that you don't approve of this, assuming you don't approve of this. And frankly, I don't see a reason why you'd be likely to. This is some messed up law. Anyway, I've been meaning to do this for a little bit, to uh, talk about this one. Um, sort of current events have pushed it back, but I think this one is really important. This one is one that, uh, as I said, is kind of shocking. So I encourage you to take action. I encourage you to do what you can, which is just to voice your displeasure. And that's about all I can say about that one. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank you for watching. Uh, please, if you've enjoyed this, like, share, and subscribe. 
I also want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, George D. Moe and People of Canada, at the $30 level, Steve Browning, and at the $20 level, Dale Nesbitt, uh, also my buddy Keith, Process Eng, Stephen Larson, Mark D., General Counsel of the CCFR, John Robinson, Tim Rogers, Roy Haddock, Frackles Dak, Jean-Alexandre Tassier, Cameron Johnson, Sir Goat, Sites and Arms Limited, Chaba Hollow, Peter H., Craig Kwan, Akin Coxall, North Central Process Service, Toys Are For Boys, Ian Vaughn, Milan Vrakic, Terrence Griffiths, Doug Thompson, Brad Crooker, Jason Harrington, Lee Kiso, Mark Stout, Michelle Stotzel, Scott Sweetman, Mike Rhodes, Alvaro Bataille, DF, Stacey Cartmel, Tactical Advantage TV Canada, Ian S., Dave Leslie, Juan, Donald Duncan, Stefan Conquest, Darren Duell, Sean Crane, Ian Hutchinson, Rory, Travis, and Kevin Fleet, all at the $10 level. Uh, I'll leave a link to this uh, particular bit of legislation. Again, I think it's very messed up legislation. I, It's shocking to me what's in here. It is just frankly shocking. And... I hope that the courts, you know, if this goes through, will overturn it. But I can't say for certain. This is... I don't think anyone's ever tried to do this before. This, to my mind, is essentially trying to upend the traditions of justice and fair trials and presumption of innocence. So, thank you for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge, and see you next time.